Hello and welcome to another episode of Soul Nectar Show, that show that talks about all things essence, where we gather around the campfire and we tell our stories of connection to that which is bigger than us, of our stories of knowing who we are beyond this finite physical body and even who we are through the expression of this finite physical body. And all the ways that we learn about the great mystery of ourselves is what we discuss on this show. And I'm your host, Carrie Hummingbird. I love these kinds of discussions. I love to shed light on the awakening process, on life. What is it we're here for? What are we doing together? How can we be in service to each other and to the planet using this information? And I'm a huge advocate of, uh, you know, anyone who's doing good things in the world, anyone who would consider themselves to be a light worker or a leader of light or, uh, you know, a, a healer, any of that. I, I think that's very important right now at this time in the world for, for us to show up with our courageous hearts and to share what we know, what we've learned, and to, to lift each other up and to spread our messages. And so today I've got another leader of light and she works through the subject of grief and death. And now isn't that fascinating? So Yvonne Heath, welcome Yvonne. Thank you so much, Carrie. It's an honor to be here. So Yvonne, I'll just tell you a little bit about Yvonne. She's married to her best friend, Jordy, has three amazing children and is loving life in beautiful Muskoka, Canada. A registered nurse since 1988, she worked in 10 different hospitals in the United States and Canada in many areas, including emergency, intensive care, chemotherapy, and hospice. Yvonne became disheartened by our society's reluctance to talk about, plan, and prepare for grief and how it causes ex excessive suffering in life and at the end of life. She suffered too, not knowing how to do it differently. In 2015, she took a leap of faith and left her nursing career with new purpose to empower people and create resilience in life, grief, and death. And she's creating social change as an author, speaker, television, radio host, and blogger. Yvonne is also passionate about sharing her message with her TED Talk, her TEDx Talk. It, it's the I Just Showed Up movement. So, wow, I want to know about all this. This is really great, Yvonne. Wow, big stuff you're doing there. I saw your hubby there trying to help you out. So, <laughs> so I, and that's life, right? You know what? And it's funny because I always say anticipate the glitches. As I was sitting here, you disappeared. And I'm sitting here, at, at, I'm not a techie person. So I said, Dirty. She disappeared and he just clicked a button. So <laughs> it put me back right on the line. <laughs> life is not perfect. And I always say, oh, please anticipate the glitches and things will happen. A, a plane will fly by as you're waiting in silence. It's just, that's life, isn't it? It is. So, well, you know, you've had enough um, magical experiences up until now to come to that understanding and just accept it for what it is. Uh, we need help. We definitely need help along the journey. So how did you get there? Like, how did you get to working on this? I know you worked in a, as a hospice and you worked with all this um, death. How did you get to this place where you finally said, you know what, this, is, this needs something else? Well, it's been a very interesting journey of really not knowing that this is where I was going to land. But I was a nurse for 27 years and I worked in the United States, Canada, and in every department from emergency, intensive care, even the delivery uh, department. And um, I was um, 14 years in chemotherapy and then hospice. What I realized is throughout there was a common thread that we really don't know what to do with grief as a society, let alone death and dying. When, when people are grieving and we grieve all kinds of things, don't we? divorce, diagnosis, job loss, mental health issues, it's all the continuum of grief. And then of course, death and dying is one of the greatest griefs we face. There's also suffering along the way. And so many times I, I would see it over here where people were having honest, open conversations, authentic and being their hot, messy selves. And, and they were able to navigate through this journey and then on the other side, people were in despair, but anger, bitterness ensued and, and not having conversations and pretending everything was fine when it wasn't. And even as a healthcare professional witnessing this, I suffered more. 
And here's the really big thing, Carrie, that really was a huge awakening for me is I would have patients like in the chemotherapy clinic who would say to me on the side, because I, I love to like hug people and I was compassionate. I, I suffered along with them, which I don't recommend that. But they would tell me, I really don't want to have this chemotherapy. I don't want this surgery. I don't want to go to the intensive care. And I would literally say to them, please tell your family, please tell your doctor, share how you feel. And they would say, no, they don't want me to give up. Excruciating, heartbreaking for them, for the family and for me. So I just thought we need to do something differently. I, I don't know what it is. And I just, I had an inner voice, you know, there was just something saying you need to do something. You need to be a voice for change. And I had no idea what that would be. And it led to love your life to death. And I just showed up and it's like, I'm just being guided along and I don't even, I just passion and purpose are driving my life. <laughs> That's as best as I can explain this incredible journey. Wow, that's really impressive. I think that, um, you know, sometimes I think we learn, I know we learn from our own personal journey of something that we have to grieve or something that we have to go through for our own life, like in our own family. And then here you are, like you're serving all of these people, like as a nurse, like your actual function is to be out there and and hold people through the most tender part of their life. Yes. Yes. And how did you, did you just feel called to be in that position? To be a nurse? Yeah. I, I went into it very naively and my mom is actually a nurse. And so was my aunt. I had no intention of being a nurse. Uh, but when I was 19, I landed a job at a facility when, you know, back in the day, when anyone with a physical or developmental disability, they were placed in an institution, right? They were, they were not, there was no inclusion and, and, and having them be a part of the community. So at 19, I ended up working at this facility and I loved everybody. <laughs> I just, I just, I just went in and I loved people and it was many people were physically very, there were a lot of deformed, challenged, and and uh, developmentally delayed. And I just, I went in there and loved everyone. And somebody said to me, you know, if you can do this, you can be a nurse. I said a nurse? What? I what are you talking about? I I had no inclination, but I went into nursing school because I didn't know what else to do. And for the first year, I just partied and had a good time. <laughs> Uh, and then the second year I thought, oh, wait a minute, maybe I, I really do want to be a nurse. And I honestly feel like I, it was, it was what I was meant to do so that I could have this experience, this 27 year wonderful career as a traveling nurse. I worked in Louisiana and Texas and New York state and then here, and I gathered all of this information for the second act of my life to to shed light on what how we can live grieve and die better right we can do it better i did also have my own personal experience in all of this where as a chemotherapy nurse and we had our older son tyler went down a dangerous road of drugs and addiction and as a mom um it was excruciating and i realized in that how, first of all, a lot of people avoided me because they didn't know what to do or say. It was awkward, it was uncomfortable when I needed them most. I needed people, I, I didn't need them to try to fix it, I just needed their support, so I, I learned a lot from that. But I also learned how ill-prepared I was to face, so what if there is a tragic ending to this story? I, I didn't feel like I would survive it. And now I have two other children here. I need to, you know, I don't want them, if there's a, a horrible situation here, I don't want them to lose their mom as well because I have met so many people who are still living. Well, they still have a pulse, but they're not really living after grief, are they? They're just, they're just existing. And so I needed to empower myself. And I always tell people I haven't started caring less I've just started accepting more, empowering myself, becoming more resilient, and 
having a belief about life and death that helps me. I've created a soft landing for myself. I have more coping skills and strategies. And it doesn't mean I won't fall apart, but I think I can uh, bounce back quicker. <laughs> right? Grief is hard. It's hard it, for me. It is. It's not easy. So, you know, here's an interesting thing, because I've noticed this in my own family, that grief has literally torn our family apart, like the loss of my dad. Mm. And there's like two camps now. There's me and my older son, and then my middle son kind of straddles the worlds. Yeah. And then there's like everybody else. You know? And I think it's like interesting, like I was trying to hang in there for a while and comfort and be around. And I, it was like, it was almost like my mom was just like furious with me. Yeah. Like she didn't want me there. And do you find that? Do you, do you find that people like when they're grieving something that they just get so, I don't know, maybe they just get so filled up with anger and resentment and self-pity and everything else that they can't even, they don't want to be around anybody to comfort them. Like they actually don't want to feel better. There, we are so, first of all, Carrie, that's, that's a really hard situation and it is not uncommon, sadly, because we are so ill-prepared for grief and we are so, we, we don't have coping skills, we don't have strategies and we don't acknowledge and allow each other's feelings. And many people have blocked themselves in bitterness and anger and they don't want to let anyone else in or the, we need someone to blame we need someone to be angry at right and and so many times it's like what did i do <laughs> you're just the person I, I i'm choosing to be angry at because either this person died or they they became really ill or they divorced you or something. And, and sometimes I just say, we can love people from a distance and keep showing up for them in the way that we can. But self-preservation also has to be the number one thing because I've gone through that with, oh, we have, we have all kinds of stories in our family too, trust me. <laughs> And, and there was a point where I remember distinctly, I was desperately trying to fix this situation and that situation. And I, I was most likely on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And my husband finally just said, you can't talk to that person anymore. <laughs> You're gonna, yeah, that's kind of what's happening You're not here. allowed to talk to them anymore. Yeah. And I just sat back and I thought, wow, I, I've been so desperately trying to fix this. And the greatest thing that we can do is just show up for ourselves first, be a great example, I, and, and acknowledge and allow their feelings and let them know. I'm here when you're ready for me to be with you or there for you. I'm still here and sending them love because it is, why would we be good at grief, right? Like, I mean, I don't think you ever get to be an expert, but we do not talk about this before. We do not prepare for end of life. And we always, and this is a little bit of tough love and hard for people to hear, we do not all die of old age. And we do not always get a warning. And we have to stop being completely, you know, shocked when someone dies. Of course you're shocked, but people are still shocked when someone dies who has had a diagnosis for 10 years and they're 99. And they're saying, I can't believe Joe died. I'm like, George, yeah, 10 years and he was that nine. was the case with my dad like my dad had leukemia for a couple of, like maybe three years yes something like that I'm yeah. not very good with time you know it's somewhere around there <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know and so we all kind of knew and he didn't actually even die from that that was in stasis he just like mysteriously boom all of a sudden bam had like a I don't know what do you call that? A cold in your lungs where he had like his lungs diminished and he only had one quarter of one lung functional oh, okay and then that's what killed him. It wasn't anything else. It wasn't the long standing thing we were all fearing. You know, right. it's just like a bam, you know, there he was gone. And that was really, like you said, there had been preparation. Like he had made sure there was preparation. Like there's preparation. I'm going to, you know, this is definitely looking like I'm going to die, you know, at some point. And mm -hmm. we just have to prepare for this. But even with all the preparation, 
you know, I think as a family, we really weren't prepared. Like he right. was, he was the big rock that held the whole thing together. Yeah. And, and admittedly, like I played my role in that because I let him do that. I didn't take command the way I did once he was gone. Like once he was gone, I had to really own myself as a mother because I didn't have, you know, someone, especially with my mother pulling away, I really had to stand on my own two feet and be there for my sons mm -hmm. in the midst of a lot of chaos and squabbling. Yes. And so it's been really interesting. It's been a big up level in terms of personal understanding and responsibility. And it's also been really hurtful and painful, you know? So yes. how, do, how do you help people recover from this? Cause you know, you've got to grieve it. I, I think, it, you know, for me, I had to talk about it. I had to admit that it was happening. I had to really, really look at and stop pretending because I have rose colored glasses. So I would like to pretend it's not happening. And that's oh. got me in more hot water for a while until I finally admitted, no, this really is happening. And this is nasty. Like, what do I do about it? You know? Yeah. 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 It is honestly. And again, what you're saying is the norm. That is what we do. Rose colored glasses are very popular in our, in our culture. And we don't want to think about it. We don't want to, you know, address it before. And we wait till we're in crisis. And when I say prepare, we're not in each other's lives forever. And again, like when you said here, your, your dad had this diagnosis and you think, well, geez, but this isn't what caused his demise. And, and it's so surprising. But we also have to except we do not know what is going on with someone interior in, in inside right they could have a heart condition we don't know about they could have a liver that's failing they could have mental health issues we weren't aware of and and we have to again part of that preparedness is saying we are not in each other's lives forever whoever's in my life right now is a complete it's just such a bonus right to have these wonderful people in my life and i i don't like it but i accept that they are not in in my life forever and i'm not in their lives forever so my greatest thing my greatest responsibility is to be complete in me right to be complete and to me that's such an incredible example to others when you're a light worker, as a parent, you know, be, be the very best version of you and learn how to just show up. That how I keep coming back to just showing up. Just show up for yourself first so that you have coping skills and you have strategies. And it is not, it is not up to anyone else to make me happy. It is not up to anyone else to support me. If they do, how wonderful. But if they need to leave, if they move, if our relationship ends, I need to still be able to stand on our own two feet or on my two feet. So it's a cultural shift. And again, we also have to forgive ourselves, grieve it, acknowledge and allow us like, wow, I really dropped the ball. I'm so dependent on this person or that person. I'm not, I wasn't prepared for grief, acknowledging and then forgive yourself, right? You just say, I didn't know what I didn't know, and now I want to do better next time because that's the best we can do, right? We can do, we can do it differently next time. That's it. There's so many things I've done that I look back and go, oh, <laughs> wish I would have done that differently. <laughs> yeah, but we don't know. I think, yeah. you know, especially when you have somebody as fantastic as my dad in your life, you know, it's just like easy to rest back. Absolutely. And lean back against that big old rock, you know, <laughs> like... And then, you know, there was so much that I found in myself once he was gone. Like I found things that I knew were there, but I could deny it because he was there. So I could lean back against him. Like things like, you know, entitlement, like expecting mm. my parents to help me, right? Like entitlement. That was a big one. I had to get rid of that. It's like, no, nobody has any need, you know, requirement to assist me, right? So I had to get over that. I was going to get any help and support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, expecting people to play nice. That's out the window. No, they're not going to play nice. So that's okay. You let go of that expectation too. It was sort of like one expectation after another that I had to let go of until the buck really stopped with me and going, okay, well, this is how it's been. And now I see 
the way the fabric of my family was with that my dad was hold, holding it all to, from leaking out. Like my dad was this big stopper on it. Mm -hmm. and, but then he was gone and it was all, you yeah. know, and I was like, okay, wait a minute. So now we see who we are. Yeah. Okay. And I, I take my part in this, you know, now I see what role I played in this. I see what role others have played in this. And I go, okay, this, in a way, this was a huge gift. And people, I'm sure my family would be like, how can you say it's a huge gift? Because that's how my dad was. My dad was a master teacher. Yes. You know, and I believe in soul agreements. I believe that we, we come in with soul agreements at a top level. We come in knowing that there'll be a moment um, where, you know, each soul in the configuration needs a certain lesson and this little kingpin needs to come out to allow that to happen. And, and then, so he, he, you know, we had this negotiation actually the morning that he died, I had a meditation and that negotiation actually happened. I remember that. And I didn't know what that meant at the time mm -hmm. until like a, a few days later. And then I went, Oh wow. That's what that was. Yes. Good for you for recognizing your part in it. Good for you for recognizing that there is opportunity in this. And that is what your dad, the gift that your dad has given your family. You have the opportunity to, to be, be the change in the family, to do, do this differently. And it's funny because in my presentations, my workshop, in all of my um, teaching, I teach seven takeaways that I believe are essential principles to live, grieve, and die well. And takeaway number five, structure your life in such a way that you are self-reliant and so are the people surrounding you, right? We are all guilty of depending on someone for whatever. And I mean, it's very critical to evaluate your life and say, where am I dependent? And where am I creating dependence? And, and mothers are notorious for that, for coddling their children and, and, and doing everything for them. And then they, you know, then they push them out of the nest and they're like, oh my God, I don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to be independent. I don't know how uh, to, to do my laundry, to pay a bill, to do, mom did everything for me. And, and we need to have our value. We need to see our value in not everyone falls apart if I'm not there. We need to see our value in just because we have value. <laughs> and of course, great leaders create great leaders, not followers, right? So I always tell my children, listen, I, you need to clean your own bathroom and put your laundry. I'm doing this for you. This is for you to be self-reliant. <laughs> <laughs> it's for you. You got to chip in. Doing it for you. So, and but again, when someone like your dad is very powerful, and it's easy, right? I mean, if I if I was the rock and and I did all these things for my kids, they'd lay back and say, "Oh, mom's mom's awesome. She does everything for us." And it's like I don't get that. <laughs> yeah, he was good at he was good at coaching us to find our own truth. And he was really good at holding things together so that um, maybe some underlying, he was good at lifting things to a soul perspective. I mm -hmm. think if I had to like say what ultimately it was, and I like your point around um, mothers doing everything for everybody because, you know, I, I had to do a lot as a kid like I was a latchkey kid and so I was responsible for like dinners for the family and a, a lot of things that you know from pretty young from elementary school wow. and so I felt like I had a lot of responsibility the entire time right mm -hmm. so then I didn't want to do that with my kids right so I totally coddled my kids mm -hmm. and then uh, during this whole thing when my dad died I was like oh my gosh, like I've got to step it up with my kids, you know? Mm -hmm. So then that process started and then that tough love piece. And then they didn't like that at all. So it's no, been... of course not. It's like, what? <laughs> yeah. They're like, you did everything for us. What are you talking about? And I'm like, hey, you need to get on your own. I'm going to help, you know, I, I see I've missed a few things. And I've had that discussion with my 19 year old. I was like, I missed a few things. I'm sorry for that. But now we're going to work through it together because, you know, I missed a few things with you yeah. and we need to, we need to work through this and you need to learn how to do it so you can do it for yourself. Cause I'm not here to create a dependency. I'm here to create a leader. 
you know. Exactly. But we know we do all of these things out of love. And it's even when, when I say we need to talk about grief before, people are just like, no, we just want to live our lives and love each other. And that's all wonderful in the bubble with the rose color, colored glasses. But grief is a part of this journey, right? And I say it's the price of sometimes the price of living and loving, but it is worth it. And our hearts will heal if if we learn to take better care of ourselves and each other. And, and, and we can do better. We can do better by acknowledging and allowing that things are hard. And, uh, and by just showing up for each other in those hard times. And the big piece also is that we have become a society that feels like the professionals are the only people qualified to be present in a crisis to be present when someone needs therapy or when someone's in the dying process whatever it is and here's the thing and it's this is very big news to people is that healthcare professionals and, and other professionals will only be available on our journey a very small portion of the time a very small fraction of the time and the rest of the time we need our village we need our family our friends our co-workers our neighbors to be able to just show up for us. However, we don't feel qualified because we think, oh, I don't, I don't know. This is what I've heard more than anything, Carrie, in the last five years. Oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. So people avoid, right? Right. So they avoid there because they're afraid to do or say the wrong thing. And I say, here it is. I have the magic answer. When you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, it's awkward, it's uncomfortable, and you can't fix it, three magic words, just show up. Yeah, just that's show it. Up, right? Like, if, if you were having, you know, when, when you're grieving, and I just walked in and said, I don't know what to say, but I'm here. I just sat down beside you. And cried with you because people. Well, what if I make them cry and say, "Oh, we'll get them a Kleenex, a tissue." <laughs> well, what if I cry? Oh, get yourself a tissue. We're we're so afraid to be human and to allow that. I said, "Of course you're going to cry. It's sad." You know, like when my son was going through all of this. If someone would have said, some people did just show up for me, but others that I was just so sure would be by my side, they avoided me. Because they, I know they wanted to fix it and they didn't feel qualified and they were awkward. So don't wait for, don't wait for it to be comfortable. It's not comfortable. Yeah. It's extremely uncomfortable when somebody it's, you love dies. Like it's yes, or the most painful issue. thing there is. It's <laughs> yeah. And, and don't try to fix it and don't minimize it. Just say, this is really sad and I'm here and I always tell people, I promise you, I am going to just show up, but I will probably be a mess. <laughs> don't expect, we don't, we don't need to be strong for each other all the time. We just need to grieve together, right? And allow the grief. And, and Yeah, and stop judging the grief. Like even now I'm tearing up because I'm thinking about my dad. I make everyone cry just so. I, I know. Can. Well, it's just, you know, but I think that if I stop <laughs> doing that, somehow I've forgotten him. Like I feel like I don't need to suffer, but I just feel like my heart opens when I think about him. And if it's going to open and it has tears, then that's fine. Well, I'm just going to let that happen wherever I, oh, I loved him so much. I still love him. Yes. And well, because I mean, love is forever, right? Yeah. Love, love lasts forever. And that's the beautiful thing is that two things you are doing. You're just saying, I still miss him and I love him. Love is forever. And the other beautiful thing, and I love this saying, and I shared it in my TED talk, because so many times people say, how do I move on? What is, like, what do I do? And of course I didn't have the answer, but now um, uh, Matthew Rutan gave me a beautiful, when his father died at his dad's um, funeral, he gave everyone these little cards. And the card said, be the evidence that someone's life made a difference. And I just... That's gorgeous. Isn't it? I know. I had to share that with you. It's beautiful. And you are doing that, right? Because you're saying, I really love, love my dad and I miss him. And I'm looking at my part in this scenario and I'm going to do my best to honor him by learning, right? Right. And learning and, the lessons that he taught me. Yeah. Absolutely. So you are being the evidence that his life made a difference. His life made a huge difference. And, yeah. you know, and I think that it's important for us to make those same 
decisions, not just about people in our lives that are easy for us to love, but the ones that are super challenging for us to love, like my mother. Yeah. <laughs> Those are that's what I'm working on now. People. Like I'm working yeah. on it because I know I see how, you know, I see her age and I see, you know, I see she doesn't want me in her life right now. She's, you know, we've had some arguments. And because I talk about it, right? I talk about it. And in my mom's generation, you're not supposed to talk about any of this. Oh, of like, course. It's definitely yeah. not okay, right? So I'm breaking all the taboos by talking about all this on, in front of all the people. And she hates it. She hates yeah. when I talk about it. And she wants me to stop. And I can't stop because it's my function. So here we go. We're at, a, we're at a crossroads. Yeah. But what I would say is that I'm working on really being grateful in advance of my mother's death for my mother in my life mm -hmm. because I have, I have had up until now a lot of resentment and anger towards my mother, right? So there's a lot of things that, you know, I'm resentful and upset about. And I think that those are the relationships though, that if we can't come to resolution on those and within ourselves and then yes. make peace with that person while they're alive, it's sort of like that thing that never gets tied off. It's like that it never gets resolved. And there's like that, that nagging sense that there could have been more. And I don't want that nagging sense. Like, I don't want that. And I refuse to let anything divide us. Like right now I'm giving her a little break, mm -hmm. but it was not going to last. Okay. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. This is a break so I can sort out me yes. and my feelings about the way she's shown up for me in my life. Mm -hmm. that's all this is. And I, I think I really encourage people, like if you've got one of those people that's just like, man, I can't be around this person right now. Cause it's like everything they say crumbles me to little bits. Yeah. You've got to like sort it out. Right. I mean, what's your thought on that? Cause how many times do you see people with somebody dying that like they're completely unresolved about? And, and the, the guilt and the remorse and the, oh my gosh, I should have done this. I think that um, it's very wise to take that time. And well, one of the quotes I did share is letting go, let go of everything but love, because at the end of the day, there are some things that are just not resolvable, right? And <laughs> they're just, so some, true. there just are. And, <laughs> and sometimes when you look back at your life and you know, if someone, if someone wishes that they had done things differently, they also have that remorse and guilt. And it's sometimes hard for them for, to see the person that reminds them what a crappy job they did. Right? Right. Which in itself is really crappy. Because yes. then you're saying that this person's crappy. And you're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I think like I see that happen with her and I'm like, stop looking at me that way because I'm actually a big success. Oh, for sure. But I think, no, I think it's a reminder of what she might not. Uh, she feels not. about herself, but she yes. projects it onto me and I don't want that anymore. You know what I'm saying? Well, and, and that's absolutely, and you don't. And I mean, I, th I encourage people to write it out. I encourage people to well, go to a therapist, talk to somebody who can help you. And I've done that. I mean, people think, oh, I shouldn't go to therapists. Please. I've gone to therapists lots of times. And why wouldn't you go to the therapist? I think, yeah. It's helpful. It's an objective opinion when you are in the weeds of life and, and you can't find your way through. And I have, I've written out things and I think I'm going to give this letter to this person and I know it's just going to destroy them. And then I burn the letter. And I just think, you know what, I'm, I'm done here. And I, we have to find that internal peace. And sometimes that means telling the person the truth. And that's hard, right? Like, you know what? This happened and this is how the story that I'm telling myself. Did you watch Brene Brown's uh, Netflix special? Have you seen that? I haven't seen it yet. Oh, you must see it. Is that Daring because, Greatly? Uh, well, yes, that's who yeah. wrote it. But, and she said how we misunderstand or how we view situations from two very different lenses, right? So the story I'm telling myself is that you have not been there for me. You have blamed me. You do not, you're not allowing me into your life. This is a story I'm telling myself. Do you have a different story or I'd like to know what you think, right? Because it's always our perspective because everyone has a different perspective of the same story, right? And we have to decide in ourselves if it's important enough for us to tell our story and live our truth, right? We have to, that authentic truth, if it's gnawing at you, 
and you need to tell a person you have to it's you know the talk i would say have that difficult conversation say we need to tell it we need to have this hard conversation and instead of you have been a this this and this it's the story i'm telling myself is that i was a latchkey kid i had a lot of responsibility i had and that was hard and i would like us to move on and i i just i need to hear whatever and then sometimes like you said I, I mean, we all have difficult people in our lives. And there have been some that I say, you know what? I'm okay to let this go now. I know you're never going to get it. And I've let it go. And I'm at peace with it. But if it keeps gnawing at you and you, they need to hear your truth, it's, it's not easy. But we have to figure out what is going to serve us the best so that we can move forward, right? Yeah, we do. And we have to make those decisions for ourselves. And I think, yes. I think that I, I really honor my mother in choosing to be my mother in this lifetime because I have big work to do on the planet. And yeah, I've got to explore all these difficult subjects and root them out and get to the bottom of the tangled mess and clean it up. And that's just part of my function. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's a really uncomfortable position for somebody to be my, my mother at this point, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> sending her love everybody. Cause it's not yeah. easy. It's not yeah. e easy to be the mother of Carrie Hummingbird. There you go. So yeah, this is tough stuff and this is global stuff. I mean, this happens and so many people will tell me, thank you so much for speaking what you spoke. I'm sure that happens for you as well. And the work that you're doing, when you bring this message, I'm sure you get resistance, but I'm sure you also get people that say, thank you for speaking this out loud yes. and being brave and courageous about speaking this out loud. Talk a little bit about that. That is uh, the most rewarding part of this journey, actually, because, you know, I, I'm in this room and I'm talking about grief and death and dying. And I hear a lot of stories and people reach out to me every day who, who have hard stories. And, you know, I am still human, so... <laughs> I really have to really have to show up for myself because I hear some very hard, sad stories. And again, it's not just end of life uh, and, and people dying. It's all kinds of hard stories. And, and the other thing about that is, and I say to people, you could have someone that you love is dying and, and you lose your job and someone dumps you and and it all happens at the same time and you're like are you kidding me seriously universe i've had enough and all these things happen yeah. but i have had people every day that reach out and say i read your book and it changed my life i heard you speak and i love the i just showed up message because i have these i just showed up bracelets awesome yes and i share those with people and and the i just showed up movement teaches people of all ages how to just show up for themselves and others so they are empowered and resilient when grief arrives. And I said, when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, just show up. And the bracelet comes with this little card that reminds people, just show up for yourself first. You have value and you matter. You matter. You matter. It has nothing to do with how popular you are, your grades, what, how far you can throw a football. You simply matter because you exist and you like love is your, your birthright, right? Love and happiness. And, and that's to remind people. And then the other thing is to remind them to just show up. I believe just showing up will change the world because literally it, whatever the problem is, we need people to just show up, right? It, it, someone, someone died. Someone is experiencing gender confusion someone is having a mental health breakdown somebody just show up <laughs> just show up you don't have to be an expert you just I, lead with your heart listen acknowledge and allow feelings and just show up and people people have sent me pictures and they're wearing their bracelet one lady sent me a picture and there was a bracelet on her great grandfather's arm and the two uh, great grandchildren were holding his hand and he was dying and they all had their bracelets on. Oh, uh, that oh, is yeah, I cried. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. Beautiful, beautiful. One, one friend whose 
her, her cousin's son died by suicide. Now, when we're talking about the deep trenches of grief, <laughs> suicide is just, right? It's just tremendous grief. And she literally, as soon as I heard, I sent her a message. This is so hard. I'm so sad. I'm here. And she said, you know, as soon as I heard it, I said the words in my head, oh my God, I don't know what to do or say. And she said, there's your voice popped in. She says, oh, that's what Yvonne says. We all say, I still say it. And she said, right, just show up. Because so many people say, I don't know if I should call. I don't know what, just call. Hug, text, email, call, sit silently, just show up. Support them, help them with life's daily tasks. Doing something is better than doing nothing. And so she called her cousin and I said, if someone doesn't want to talk, they won't answer the phone or, or it'll be a very brief conversation. And she said her cousin talked to her for 20 minutes and they just mostly cried, right? She didn't say anything brilliant. She didn't need a PhD. She just said, oh my God, and, and listened and cried. Yeah, and I think my only lesson I would add to that is something I got from the Four Agreements with Don Miguel Ruiz is don't mm -hmm. take anything personally. Right. That's a hard one, and I just say right. that one is one I've really worked on through my dad's death. Yes. Is not taking it personally that my mom, who was really grieving the loss of her life partner for 44 years, oh. was so angry that she, that she needed to put it somewhere, and she tried to put it on me. Yes. And I couldn't handle that. So because I took it really personally, it hurt my feelings. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. and I, that was a huge lesson in not taking it personally. Yes. Very That's why we need to have a full cup in ourselves. That's why we really need to love ourselves. And so really? that was another whole level of loving myself. I love you talk about that message. Yeah. And, and sh yeah, just show up for yourself first. And when you feel depleted and I say to people, check in and here's the thing. See, this is, this is also where we cause our own suffering though, is when we don't just show up, right? It, it, when someone is in crisis or grieving and we don't just show up, they don't feel supported and we feel awful. <laughs> we feel awful. Yeah, I feel awful because I'm not showing up for her because of the attacking, right? And yeah. because I, I don't know what to do with it. But that's a whole different, you, again, if someone is attacking you, you know, you can say, mom, I love you. I'm over here. When we can have a conversation, I, I feel hurt right now. The way we're communicating i i'm feeling too vulnerable to just show up for you i can't be there yeah but i would love i would love to be when you're ready and i still love you and just sending them love right just sending them love and but you can't i mean you can't just show up and go get beat up I mean, right that's, and that's the pattern that's, a lot of my people see the reason why i bring this up is because a lot of people that follow me they have similar dynamics, right, in their yes. family structures where they've been like the black sheep of the family and been blamed mm -hmm. for things. Yeah, you know that one, right? So it's a difficult spot because, you know, most of my people have huge hearts. Like they really want to help, right? They, they want to over help probably. Mm -hmm. and, and they can't because they've had to just go, okay, I can't for now. I've got to like leave this alone and let this person go through their journey on their own, I guess, until they're willing to come around. And do you see cases like that where people finally do come back around and say, hey, I was experiencing a lot of grief and now I'm ready? Absolutely. And, you know, it, again, everybody has their grief journey. And sometimes you cannot, you, you're not allowed in. You're not allowed in. So another thing I, I tell people is if you can't just show up for someone who's grieving, just show up for Others, there are many, there's other people who are also affected by this situation and continue, you can just show up for them and, and gather with people who will support you and, and support people who are letting you in and always inviting that other person to write, we're here, we're doing this. I'm, cause we, I mean, you can't push a rope either, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's you for sure. Force. Especially a stubborn yeah. rope. You definitely oh. cannot push a stubborn rope. <laughs> you cannot. And the other thing is, is that honestly, I mean, this, this would have to be a whole other show when people feel obligated there. Many people have difficult relationships within families. And, you know, I don't always believe that in the obligation that I have to go spend time with someone when I walk away feeling a wreck. I just, 
I, I no longer choose to do that because I have really important work in the world as you do global movement and and everyone's welcome to come along but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend time with toxic people or I'm going to really limit it and um, that is my choice as well so if there are toxic people that will be in my circle I make sure there's a lot of other people around <laughs> Yeah, to support you. So you have this. Yeah. I think that's the key. It's like making sure your your bucket's full and you're you know you're bubbled up before you go in. And yeah, because this is about being a courageous heart, you know. Because White Eagle has definitely shared with me, love everyone, every single human. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a big job. And yeah, there's a process to this. I feel like there's. It's not just like a throw the cape open and run naked through the field you know <laughs> like, yeah well exactly and, and you you can you're still human right I'm a human you're, being yeah you're a human being and and so i have one friend his father's an alcoholic and i i have said like so i don't know that i would spend the time that she does and they've had a very challenging relationship their whole lives and she still chooses to visit him and he's he's not drinking so he is like that bitter sober right alcoholic and when he she knows that she'll spend some time with him and he's passive aggressive and then and then he'll turn and she won't he'll start to attack her and she just says okay dad well it looks like we're done here because you're not being kind so i'm gonna go now and take care love you and leaves um I, I think that's, I don't think I'm that nice, <laughs> like, but you also have to see where, what you need in this, right? What you need to do. And like I said, there's some relationships that I've just chosen to distance myself because I need everything. <laughs> I, I need a full bucket. I need to, to propel this forward and this message. So, you know. You, you can't, there, there's so many people to love and there's so many people to love you back. If someone isn't ready, say, I'm here and I'm ready when you are. And I think in a way that's a form of respect too, is to, is to not have so much self-importance that you think that person has to be in your life. Yeah. It's actually not required. No. Nope. But there is an invitation, you know, like you said, if you can be respectful and honor me yeah. as, as I'm going to be respectful and honor you, then we have common ground to stand on. That's right. That's right. And if, and if that is not possible, then okay, well, and, and you can grieve that as well. Cause you're, it's, and it's, I have done a lot of grieving of that because yeah. I realized that that wasn't something that was desired. Right. Absolutely. So that's yeah. a hard thing for a little, a little girl inside of me to hear. And that's the work I do with clients too. But see, that's, I think, I know this is all for my purpose because I have to walk the walk that I'm going to lead other people to walk. And what's the most painful thing in the world that you could feel is that your own mother doesn't love you mm. enough to want to be part of your life. Mm. That is the most, that has got to be the most painful thing that anybody could feel. But you know, you, I mean, you know <laughs> that, but that comes from, I, like how sad for you to feel that, but imagine being that person. Imagine being that mom that is so stuck. That's so stuck, right? I, I have. You can't open her heart. Yes. Yeah, that hurts me sometimes with my kids too. Like when I find myself repeating a little bit of that pattern or like I feel like there's a closing a little, like a little layer that wants to come over and I'm, I'm fierce with it. I'm just like, Rush, you know, right. you will not close up my heart. I am so going to be present with my kids, no matter what crazy antic they pull, you know, you've, like, you've, that is such a decision you've made, right? Yeah. And you are, you're not afraid to rip that open and feel that pain. Some people think, oh my gosh, I can't do this. It's going to be painful. They're not ready. And that's that whole vulnerability, allowing grief, right? It's like, I'm here. My heart is wide open. I mean, my heart's open to the world to share their grief with me. There's going to be days that I won't be able to stop crying. I'm okay with that. I will recover because there's so much joy in, in knowing that you made a difference when you just showed up for someone, right? So, so when I think of your mom or somebody that's so close, I mean, there's no, you can't have 
joy and happiness in there. You've, yeah, you've, you have to have it all. That's right. You can't selectively feel. No. And with you, like, I'm okay grieving. I'm okay letting the tears roll down my face. I'm okay, like, I hear my clients sometimes, they share these things with me, and it just breaks my heart open. Just like, oh, my gosh, like, how painful is that? But then I love to lead them through that space back to the joy Absolutely. because we don't have to stay there. We don't have to stay stuck in that spot. Yeah. And, and I, it is a know. roller coaster, right? Grief and joy, grief and joy. Grief it's and joy. They live right next to each other. It's never all one or the other. It's <laughs> yeah. a roller coaster and we have to learn how to hang on through the dips and curves. I love that. It's so true. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you, there's no like just all joy amusement park ride. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, exactly. There's right? a fake one, but it's, but it's fake. It's not real. Yeah. You got to go. Yeah. Authentic joy is just worth every bit of grief. Yeah. And when you've had grief you, and, and you experience joy, isn't it? It's just so much sweeter, right? Like, so oh, much sweeter. Oh, I love this. It's like, a, it's like a land you can stand on. It's not like a, like a fluffy concept. It's like, right. It has substance. I think sometimes yeah. there's like fake joy that's like airy and it doesn't really, it doesn't have any volume to it. Right. And then there's like real joy that just like, but just bubbles up from within. It just expands. It's amazing. Yeah. And, the, and there's choices we make, right? There's choices to be grateful. There's choices to love with no attachment of whether someone's going to love us back. I mean, I, I named 10, 10 things that I am grateful for every night of my life. And I mean, sometimes, you know, the days that have been a little more challenging and I'm like, I am so grateful for my love your life to death. <laughs> <laughs> I am so grateful that so I have grateful that for my glasses, <laughs> great coffee, you know, like sometimes I'm like stretching, but <laughs> love and gratitude. It sounds cliche, but it, it it helps. It's we good are in medicine. charge of filling our own bucket too, right? It's, it's nobody else's responsibility but our own. And especially again, when we choose to be a light in the world, we have to be filling our own bucket along the way constantly, especially in challenges and grief. We just have to keep filling our own bucket. And I think it can feel like we're, we're doing double duty, you know, because we, are, I, we have to do a lot of inner exploration and inner work to help other people. So not only are we listening to other people's stuff and helping them through it, but in order to do that really well, we got to dive into our own stuff and like go all the way down to the bottom and clean it out. Oh, so oh. It's exhausting. So you give yourself some space and time, right? Awesome. Like integrate. Absolutely. Yeah. None of this is easier said than done. Yes. It's all easier said than done, but it is worth it. That's the, you know, it is worth it. And um, again, as a healthcare professional, I did not have these coping skills and strategies. And I, I have such tremendous deep joy in my life now in the face of grief every day hearing it. But I know what I get my, the greatest joy in is just showing up for myself and just showing up for other people. And just showing up doesn't mean you carry it on your back with you and no. you go home. <laughs> you every, just we have up. to stop judging everyone's journey, right? Everyone's on their journey, and that's their journey for, I don't know what their purpose is, what their reason, but mine is mine. So, and many people, again, I shared this in my TED Talk, to accept that some, many people have hard, or some people have harder journeys than others but it is not our job to judge or to fix it, but we can love them along the way. And we can just show up and witness it and hold their hand and hold their hand and look them in the eye. Hold their hands. Exactly. That's right. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much. How beautiful, Yvonne. I really appreciate this. It's what a beautiful gift. So quick. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Did you have um, any way that people, you want people to connect with you or get started with you? Is there a, I would love people, if anyone wants to go to our website, loveyourlifetodeath.com, and if they follow us, they will get the seven takeaways, and there are tips on how to just show up for other people, and if anybody wants to uh, send, send us a message, and they follow us, and they say, I heard you on Carrie's show, I'll send them an I Just Showed Up bracelet and, uh, and the little card. If oh, they, great. So they just message you or they just reach out on Facebook or any social media and say, yeah. hey, if I heard about you yeah, on, hey, on Soul you. Nectar Show and I want my bracelet. I want my bracelet. <laughs> That's, oh, how cool, guys. She's going to give you a cool I just showed up bracelet. I love my bracelet. I have it on 24-7 no matter what I'm wearing. 
That is so cool. Thank you for that gift. That's wonderful. So be, be sure to claim that, you guys, as you're listening to this. Go get it. All right. So now I'm going to just encourage everybody to please uh, definitely claim your gift with Yvonne and be sure to leave a review for this episode on uh, wherever you found it, iTunes or YouTube or Spotify or who else, you know, where else is it? It's everywhere. Wherever you found it, please leave a review. And also, um, you know, give us a rating as iTunes, uh, particularly, because that's a good platform for people to find this kind of material. And it'd be helpful if we get better ratings if um, more people find it, if you leave a rating. So please do. And I'm going to give you kisses now. You guys ready? You want to help me? Here we go. <laughs> All right. Here they come, guys. <laughs> love you guys i hope this helped you and hope if share it with anybody who has a grieving going on right now in their lives of any kind many blessings everybody we'll see you next week on soul nectar show